As you can see, this patient's got a pre-existing PFM on tooth number eight, kind of high value, kind of opaque. He's a class two, division two. You can see that deep overbite that he's got going on here. So I like the idea of a Bruxer crown because I can keep it almost as thin as that PFM was on the lingual. So we're gonna go ahead and anesthetize and then take off this crown. That's a razor burr from Axis Dellen. Ah, oh, what a joy it is to cut off a PFM these days after cutting off nothing but Emacs and Bruxer. I feel like I'm on vacation when I'm taking off a, a PFM now. I literally will put my feet up and have a drink with an umbrella in it in the other hand as I take off the PFM because it's that relaxing. Because look at this, you just rotate with the crown remover back and forth and it just falls off. You know if that was a Bruxer crown, I would have had to cut it two or three more times. Uh, to get it off of there. You can see that it's been endodontically treated and that looks like the tip of a gold uh, post that we might be looking at in the incisal ledge. What kind of gold? I'm not sure. We're going to start by putting our first cord in. This is a double zero ultra pack cord from Ultradent. You know, these types of preparations where you're not starting from scratch with a virgin tooth, where you're taking off a crown and it's already shaped and now you have to go in and kind of finish it. You can see how it's a little over tapered and really all we're doing here for the most part, we're doing most of our preparation in the apical third of this tooth. So there's my favorite burr, the 856025 burr. It's an endodontically treated tooth and I don't have to do a ton of reduction. It's more about where I'm doing the reduction. So I've got the speed turned down to 2000 RPMs and I'm gonna do most of this reshaping dry. And I must have brushed that burr against the gingiva and that's why we've got a little bleeding there. So we're gonna use the Viscostat Clear uh, from Ultradent. That's always my first choice uh, for an astringent in the anterior because we don't get any discoloration of the gingiva. If that doesn't work, then we have to continue to move on and go to the ferric sulfate, which works even better, but it will cause some discoloration on the gingiva. I've exposed a little bit of gold there, so I'm just gonna cover this up. Uh, this is a little, little Vertis Flow from Kerr. This is a self-etching composite resin, so I put it on the tooth and just agitate it with a brush for about 15 seconds. And then we're gonna go ahead and cure that. And once we've cured it, we can just add a little more composite. So because it's a self-adhering composite, we don't need to etch or use a separate bonding agent. Here I'm smoothing off the prep with an 856025 burr. So that's the exact same shape as that other coarse burr I was using. It's just much smoother, so it gets rid of all the little chips out of the margin. The top cord that goes into place is a 2E cord, Ultra Pack cord from Ultradent. The E stands for epinephrine. And in the case of a tooth like this where I have abraded the gingiva a little bit and the gingiva is already a little irritated, um, it feels good knowing that I've got uh, some epinephrine in there because I got a better chance of getting a nice impression. And uh, this patient was able to tolerate the epinephrine in the local anesthetic injection, so I think he's gonna be just fine uh, with it being in the cord. Uh, again, I've exposed a little part of the buildup there of the gold post uh, or core that's in place, that's gonna be okay, no, nothing's gonna show through Bruxer. There's an anatomic copper cap that he had a little difficult time biting down on because of the way his bite is. And you can see when that top cord comes out, we just got a big old sulcus. It'd be hard to miss that impression, frankly. I mean, you've just basically got a moat around the castle and now we're just filling it up with the polyvinyl uh, material. And you know, that's what I love about the two core technique as much as I'm always you know, looking to help uh, Dennis find a way. By the way, look at that. I don't know if you saw that lower anterior tooth with the wear on it from the PFM. But I'm always finding, uh, trying to find a better way for Dennis so we don't have to pack two cords. And you know, I'm, I'm stumbling upon one now that looks like it might work, but you just don't get the same kind of consistent results that you do with that, that two cord technique. And that's one of the reasons I feel compelled to, uh, to stick with it. So it's been uh, about six days and we're gonna go ahead and take off the temporary now and and clean things up and uh, try on the restorations and see uh, if in fact we like uh, how they look. And so we've got, look at a little temporary cement actually stuck right on that spot where the gold uh, buildup was. So we're just gonna make sure that we clean off all this excess temporary cement. Sometimes we'll do it with a sonic scaler, especially if we use Duralon as a temporary cement, but we just wanna make sure everything's nice and clean because that's one of the main reasons for crowns not seating completely is a little piece of temporary cement still on the tooth. So we tried in both the restorations and the patient liked uh, how they look. So we're jumping right ahead to the cementation and the bonding. So that's the Preppies pumice from Whip Mix. I love this because it's disposable and it just gets used once and tossed away. 
I'm pretty sure that in my dad's polishing lathe in his dental office, the pumice that was in there had been there for about, uh, had been there for about 20 years and uh, it's pretty disgusting. I like having the unidose ones. We noticed that sharp angle um, on that central incisor where the arrow was pointing where that old composite is. So I'm, I'm just rounding that off a little bit um, because it looks on the model like I can't really see uh, that that sharp angle uh, is there. So we're just doing a little recontouring there and uh, now drying it off with the ADEC warm tooth dryer. This is uh, the one hose that we have on our unit that has never had any oil in it or had a handpiece uh, been run by it and so it works uh, really well. And uh, now we're putting this into place so we're going to cement this crown uh, with the uh, Ceramer cement, Ceramer C&B from Doxa. Again, the thing I love about the Ceramer cement besides the easy cleanup is the fact that it bonds on its own to zirconia without needing to decontaminate the internal surface of the Bruxer crown or use a zirconia primer. Uh, so a couple nice things about the Ceramer where we don't have to worry about it. It'll typically clean up in just one piece. So as you see, I kind of teasing off with the Explorer as my assistant picks it up and that's how it cleans up. And it's mainly because it's the only um, permanent cement that I've ever used that goes through a doughy stage like that, which makes it simple to clean up and, and very easy uh, to clean up interproximally as well. So we don't get chunks stuck there like we used to with our resin modified glass ionomer. So we've isolated uh, the two adjacent teeth with a couple mylar strips. And now we're going to go ahead and etch. I can get the etch right up to the gingiva. In fact, I can even touch the gingiva because this is a no prep veneer. Anytime we prepare gingiva and we do temporary veneers, the gingiva almost always ends up being irritated. And uh, as a result, you have to be very careful getting acid etch near it. It will cause spontaneous bleeding, but we don't have to worry about that here. And since we don't have any dentin exposed, we're just going right to a bonding agent without any need for a primer here from the Scotch Bond system. And so we're painting that on all the surfaces of the tooth. And it's okay to get a little on the gingiva or in the sulcus. That's all gonna be cleaned up later. So we will air thin that and go ahead and cure it. The thickness of this is not gonna affect the seating uh, of this veneer. So even if it was a traditional prep veneer or a minimally prep veneer, we would do it the same way. You can see I've got a little bounce back there on the gingiva is I want to make sure that I get this nice and tight. And so because of that bounce back on no prep veneers, we will, we will often kind of see that bounce back. So you all at times have to hold it in place as you cure it to make sure that it doesn't move at all. And it's one of the things that you want to watch out for. In fact, when we do larger no prep cases, the way these veneers kind of float around as you're try to, trying to seat them into place is, is definitely something to keep an eye on. It's not the same as seating crowns or even regular prep veneers where they just go in one way and they slide down into place and that's where they stop. There's really no margin here for the restoration to contact as it goes down into place. Um, and as a result, they, they can move around and will often slide too far gingival. So it's something to kind of be uh, aware of. In the case of one like this, it's a little bit easier, but you could see if I had wanted to that I probably could have uh, overseated this and had it slide up uh, too far. Uh, sometimes uh, my technician that I work with here at the laboratory will put a little finger on a no prep veneer that actually wraps over the incisal edge so it'll slide down and it'll stop when that finger hits but then you have to take a burr out and cut off that little finger uh, afterwards. So um, here's the patient afterwards in the after photos. These were actually taken uh, uh, that same day right after that and so we still have a little dehydration there. Um, but looking pretty good considering that those are solid zirconia crowns. They don't look as good um, as natural teeth, but um, they're starting to look better and better because of the increased translucency in that material. And so now I'm feeling more confident that I'm, I'm placing a crown on a single anterior tooth that I can place a Bruxer veneer on the tooth next to it so that the two teeth match because as long as eight and nine match, we have a chance of having a nice smile. If eight and nine don't match, there's no chance that smile is going to look aesthetic or be pleasing to the patient.